be comfortable. Good morning. Good morning. So where I went to school, it was required for kids in the seventh and eighth grade to learn Latin as part of our primary education. It was a small school, but bear in mind that the whole grade took this class together, so it was a big class. And not just the kids who had specifically elected to study Latin at that age. So in the seventh grade, we had this real battle axe teaching us. There was, there was no messing with her, and we all learned us some Latin. In the eighth grade, we had a different teacher. He was in his early 20s, and he wasn't really equipped to engage with an entire grade of 13 and 14 year olds. He had this quality, I don't think there's a way to describe it, beyond saying that I think that if most people had continual interaction with him as their 13 or 14 year old selves, they would experience this cosmic obligation to mess with him. If there was a rake lying on the ground, this guy was going to step on it. He literally drove a jalopy where the exhaust fired off like a gunshot as he'd wheel out of the school parking lot. And although not a large man by any means, he, met, he once managed to split his pants while writing on the blackboard. Now bear in mind, he actively cultivated a rather re weird relationship with the student body as well. For example, I really enjoyed Latin, at least for the year before, so I asked a lot of questions. And at a parent-teacher conference, he communicated to my parents that he thought I was either stupid or I was messing with them. So take that in so as to set the stage for an occasion when the eighth grade was particularly unruly one day, and consequently, he gave the entire grade detention an action that probably did not reflect well on his record as an educator. At the end of the day, only one student actually showed up to serve detention, the only time in his young life he ever received detention before or since. The question is, was this lad so saintly as to suffer for the sins of his entire grade? Was he actually an especially far-sighted mischief maker? Or was he just stupid? The answer may surprise you. Today's gospel lesson is one that is easily digested, perhaps too much so for its own good. It's easy enough for us to cast ourselves in the role of the tax collector and dismiss the Pharisee immediately. It's easy for the practice of humility to be reduced to a gesture and become yet another basis with which to compare ourselves to others. In part, we owe this to our distant relationship with the character archetypes presented in this parable. A tax collector in Christ's time was not an unfairly maligned pencil pusher with a thankless job, not an underdog in whom only Christ saw value. This was a genuine and profound sinner who was, at best, looking out for the well-being of his own family through being a traitor to his enslaved siblings. We know the Pharisee as a naysayer to Jesus' teachings, but in actuality, a Pharisee was simply a representative of the same set of traditions that Jesus observed, and of the same rabbinical tradition that endured into modern Judaism. Not far flung from what we would today refer to as a good adherent to the faith. So there's an element of irony in this parable that is somewhat lost to time. Now, I think we all know someone, and I think we have all been someone on occasion, who has made a big show of our faith, perhaps even showcasing our humility for the sake of appearances. The Pharisee today doesn't bother to feign humility, nor does St. Paul in the epistle today, but I think it's important for us to consider, as C.S. Lewis put it, true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of yourself less. What I would add is that humility is a sentiment we should aspire to feel, to experience internally, rather than a quality we should aspire to possess. People who win major awards often say the experience is humbling, the sentiment being that the accomplishment feels bigger than the self. I've digressed a bit because this is ostensibly a lesson in humility, but this is not about daily conduct, this is about prayer. The Pharisee in this story is probably harmless and the tax collector is, by definition, a negative contributor to society. 
One could speculate that the Pharisee leads a humble lifestyle, but with a prideful sentiment behind it. What seems to be the unified theological view on the virtue of humility is that it is valuable as an inspiration for people to exalt each other rather than themselves, and to put the collective needs of the community before their own. So the irony here, to reiterate, is the contrast between the prayers and the actions of both these parties, the Pharisee and the tax collector. I find this a stimulating lesson personally because a big priority in my sense of ministry is not just saying our prayers, but also in committing to them in our lives. The goal in any practice is to bring theory into reality. The moral philosophy of Jesus Christ was not novel in the eyes of his people, nor was it exotic in the Hellenistic Greek world. What was novel was the incarnational nature of God. God as a real person, not as an abstract practice of traditions. So for us, that doesn't necessarily mean we should be looking for burning buildings to run into, but it does mean we need to do more than just show faith, more than just recite faith. Over the past few weeks, some of us have been learning about praying with scripture. At the beginning of that series, we discussed what we thought prayer was. Communicating with God, I think, encompasses how people uh, envision prayer. But what makes prayer real? We talk to God, but how does God talk back? It's not as though we should say, God, may I have an apple, and then expect an apple to appear. But if we bear ourselves humbly, as we truly are before God, God will talk back by changing us. The Pharisee today, though perhaps legitimately virtuous in his conduct, failed in his prayer because he talked at God. He did not communicate with God. He learned nothing and he did not change. The tax collector, though truly a sinner, was justified because he felt God's answer. He was truly repentant in his heart and was justified. What that means in the long term, I don't know, but I would like to think that he became a truly virtuous individual like the Pharisee claimed to be. Perhaps, like Matthew, he walked away from his tax booth into a life of discipleship. I'd like to think he did. So why the shaggy dog story about my Latin class? The truth is, I don't know why I was the only student to serve that detention. It probably would have been better for that teacher if I hadn't shown up. But hey, when I did show up, he actually made me sit the hour and I did actually feel bad about it, even though I wasn't actually an unruly student. I'm no role model, but I think that both from the outside looking in, as well as, my, as in my own recollection, this serves as a good mechanical illustration of the other side of humility and the other side of an active life of prayer that I advocate for. While it's good to focus on others rather than ourselves, it's also not only morally ill-advised, but impractical to presume to judge them negatively. Further, prayer does not begin and end on our knees. We should always be open to hear God's voice and recognize that it may come in a form that runs contrary to our expectations or judgments even if it comes from tax collectors, goofball Latin teachers, or bratty Pharisaic teens. Amen. <laughs>